Vlad has asked me to wait five minutes before he arrives, but uh, he will show up anyway. He's he's just doing some administrative stuff, so he, uh, oh, probably giving some keys to copy or something like that. So um, maybe before starting today, just uh, so today's schedule. Okay, so. <laughs> 9.30-something uh, to noon. Well, you will see. And then at 3 to, I don't know, uh, I will uh, continue what I started uh, the other afternoon, which is uh, uh, conformal invariance of the easing model. Second part. Ah, I think this is okay. So, so the the paper corresponding to this, so Stas's paper, is here. So you can take it if you if you don't have it yet. And uh, so, Vladas, I understand that tomorrow is a is a holiday again. So uh, at IMPA. In the city, okay. So there are no lectures tomorrow. Is that okay? And then, so I will lecture on Thursday and Friday again at 9:30, and in the afternoons there will be some activity again. Probably Pierre and Christophe will. I mean, uh, they are not here, so. Right. Yes. So, I mean, the story that uh, Christophe will tell you about is about um, you take a critical population at p equal one half, and uh, there's a natural way to put some dynamics on it. So, to view so that basically at each cell uh, of, the, of the lattice, you know, it stays white for a certain time, and then after a certain time it becomes black, it stays black, and then it becomes white again. And so if you fix, uh, if you take a picture of what you see at, time, uh, at a given time, then you see just percolation. But if you look at the evolution of the dynamics, then you want to try to see basically how the you know, crossing probabilities uh, fluctuate and if, if the picture changes, how much do you have to change in order to actually uh, see things happening. Are there exceptional times at which you see, see certain things uh, that do not happen usually? at a typical time. And uh, it's very nice because you, you, you need to introduce some uh, you know, tools that you haven't seen at all here, which have to do with Fourier type analysis of uh, Boolean functions. So, uh, OK. And uh, probably the other afternoon, there will be a session probably by Pierre, or, because there's one thing I will not prove today that he will probably prove in one session. He doesn't know it yet. But, uh. OK, so I guess we can start. So I mean, the goal, you know, is it's, I'm doing these lectures for you. So you have to, to tell me if it's too slow, too fast, and so on. I mean, the goal is that you understand uh, uh, what is going on. Uh, so probably I will not, today I will try to go be rather on the slow side, even though um, Okay, you will see. I have to to find a, a right, you know, compromise between going into too many technical details, but uh, and uh, you know, just giving the ideas without uh, uh, any technical detail. So I will still try to explain to you because this is really the one key point of of, of this whole story that is uh, maybe not so uh, commonly or spread uh, well written up. Um, uh, or it's maybe not so easy to, to, to read these things, uh, which is about the convergence, basically, of uh, the discrete percolation exploration process to the SLE process. So uh, maybe I, I will start with uh, recalling sort of a few facts. So, so 
The first thing is uh, sort of Levner chains. And um, I will state uh, a theorem or proposition that uh, Christophe has uh, proved, I think, uh, on Friday afternoon for those who uh, came to the afternoon session. Um, and the idea is the following. So imagine that you have, um, if you're on the upper half plane, And imagine that you have KT, a growing family or increasing family of, of compact sets in H bar. So basically, this is K times T, and this is KS when S is larger than T. And these compact sets are always, you know, connected to the boundary, I mean, to the real line, right? Assume that then um, there are two uh, equivalent things, the following two uh, uh, properties. Equivalent. So property one, which is that it is possible to construct KT out of a Levner chain, right? So that means that there exists a continuous function, continuous real valued function. W of T such that uh, if one defines for all z in the upper half plane uh, gt of z, t gives the function t gives gt of z as the solution to the ODE, which is the one given by Leuven's differential equation. Right. For the moment, there's nothing you know, random, right? This is just a statement about deterministically growing uh, compact sets. So if so, you start with a continuous function w, uh, which is the idea. You know, it's this. Uh, okay, I'll say in a moment well, what it is. So you define this, and you have to get prescribe the starting point. So that's right. Then, which is up, which is well defined. up to Tz, which is, you know, this is an ordinary differential equation. So it will make sense as long as uh, the derivative here doesn't blow to go to infinity. And this basically you have to stop. At that point, you have to stop uh, the story. And this depends on the value of the starting point, I mean, this, the, the, on, on Z, right? For each given Z, this equation might blow up at some time or might just, or maybe it never blows up. So you define this blowing up time as being something like uh, uh, maybe supremum over epsilon positive. OK, that's really the of uh, the first uh, t such that uh, gt of z minus wt smaller than epsilon, something like that. Right, so that's just, you know, the first time at which GT hits W. Right, that just means the first time at which GT minus WT goes to zero. Okay, so then KT is just the set of Z in each bar. Maybe we should say here for any such that t of z is smaller than t. So, right, so 
this means just that kt is the set of points uh, that did hit this singularity, the point at which uh, this thing moves. So maybe I should remind you sort of the, the picture then is therefore something like you have kt here. The conformal map gt, you know, if this is the case, then gt is the unique conformal map such, I mean, from h minus kt onto h normalized at infinity. So gt of z is z plus little o of 1 as z goes to infinity. So the idea is the following, is that, roughly speaking, when you have a continuous function like this, and you have this growing uh, family of compact sets, kt, then the idea is basically that here, you are locally growing here. So in other words, here you are something growing locally here. And... Um, and therefore, the points at which gt of z hits wt correspond exactly to the points, basically, that on this red thing here, you know, such that gt of z hits w means just that you get closer and closer to the points where the thing is actually growing there. Right? So this is basically, uh, so property one just means kt can be defined via a Leuvner chain. So one can characterize this, I mean, this increasing family of compact sets can be defined via this ordinary differential equation. So if you remember uh, what we did last time, we started with the idea that implicitly that kt was an increase, uh, that was a simple curve. Okay. And in fact, what, what you construct, you know, if you go the other way around, you start with w and you try to see what you construct by this procedure. Um, for those who went to Christoph's lecture on, 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 on Friday afternoon, you see that it's possible to construct all sorts of things which are not necessarily simple curves. So for instance, just he certainly gave you this fir first example, which is imagine you have a curve like that does this and that then hits the boundary and goes away here. Then basically, just before you hit, you know, this curve gamma increases like this, just before that, the conformal map GT, because it's normalized at infinity, all the points you know that are here, just before you hit here, the boundary, seen from infinity, you know it's very hard to see them because you have to go through this very narrow thing. And you normalize things near infinity. So what happens is that via this conformal map GT, all these red things, you know, they, got, they get you know, mapped onto a very small point here, a very small domain. And so when, when gamma hits the, at the moment when gamma hits the boundary, you know, all these points z that are in the, in the red thing disappear simultaneously, right? So, which explains why here, kt, you don't say that kt is, a, is necessarily, you know, a, 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 function, a, a curve. It, it may be, a, you know, a big set that you define in this way. And actually, sort of the, I'm pretty sure, Christophe, also showed you the, the picture where, where you have a curve you know, that winds infinitely often around the circle in one direction, winds out infinitely in the other direction. And that, in that case, there still exist, I mean, this weird thing is still defined by a continuous function w, and the thing that you get out is not even a curve itself. I mean, so you can have very strange things. However, I mean, the, the interesting thing is that in this deterministic setting, you might want to think, you know, when, under what condition on W, do you know that the set KT that you get is a simple curve, for instance, or a nice smooth curve? And I think Christophe has explained to you on, on Wednesday that basically the nasty things, you know, this type of blobs like this, or these winding things, they start to appear as soon as uh, the Herder regularity of W is uh, one half. That's, that's where you, know, start, you start having problems. And as you know, in SLE, the, the W that we plug in 
this Brownian motion, which is precisely uh, not, doesn't have the other one half regularity, so it's exactly there where you know things start to get wrong. So it should not be a surprise that depending on the intensity of, I mean, you know, if W is a Brownian motion, or two times a Brownian motion, or three times a Brownian motion, things, you know, become worse and worse if you want, if you have the parameter kappa of the SLE getting larger and larger. Okay, so that's just property one. So, and the second property uh, that is equivalent to this first one is basically characterization of the set of growing hulls that you can construct using W. That's what I'm stating here. It's the following. is the first thing, the half-plane capacity of KT is 2T for any T. Remember, if we construct a growing set of hulls like this, starting from a Löwner chain, what you end up here, in fact, is that GT of Z will end up Will, will be of order z plus 2t over z plus little o of 1 over z. That's what we saw that, uh, the other time. So necessarily, you know, if you want to have an increasing set of compacts that you construct in such a way, you, it needs to grow at the right speed. Otherwise, uh, you cannot say it is a, an SLE. So that's, that's the first thing. Of course, if kt would not be if the H, I mean the half-plane capacity of HT of KT is, would not be 2T, then, uh, but still is continuously increasing, then you could always reparameterize, you know, this increasing set of compact hulls, or compact sets in such a way that the half-plane capacity is 2T. So it's just a, this is just a question of the fact that the capacity increases continuously, and you look, you have chosen the right parameterization. That's the first thing. And the second thing is sort of what you may think of a local growth condition. So it's a condition that says that basically, you know, KT is growing, but it's growing at one point at a time. You know, you want to forbid, you want to forbid things like, uh, you know, if KT would be, you know, an increasing semi-disc, semi this is something you want to forbid because this will not, you know, uh, correspond to a local growth condition in the sense that uh, something that grows just near one point here, which is one, well, what you would uh, need here. So the local growth condition is expressed as follows. It looks like a uniform continuity type statement for only all epsilon positive. There exists a delta such that for any t smaller than t0, one can find a set S of diameter smaller than epsilon in H minus KT that disconnects, I'll show a picture in a moment, uh, KT plus delta minus KT from infinity in H minus K. So what does this mean? This means the following. Here you have KT. Okay. Uh, what you want to say is roughly saying that KT is uh, growing locally. Okay. So the natural thing to do would say, well, I'm basically that you know, the diameter, you might want to say maybe kt plus delta, that's the first attempt, minus kt, that the size of this thing goes to zero, you know, as uh, delta goes, when t is fixed and delta goes to zero, uh, because it grows locally just at one point. Okay, that would be the first attempt. But then you, you, you realize that, you know, because of this picture, you know, it may be that actually kt plus delta, you know, it's this entire thing and that kt is just this thing. So you need to say that this is still a local growth. So the trick is to say, well, basically here, you can find here a little, a little set of small diameter here that disconnects the entire kt plus delta 
from infinity in h minus kt. So that's the idea. So the, the picture basically is, for instance, that you might say that if this is kt, and then a bit later, this would be kt plus delta. Okay. What you say is that at that time t, this little set s of diameter smaller than epsilon is going to be something like here, right? Because here, if you add the red thing to the white one, you disconnect completely the blue one from infinity. Okay. So the local growth condition is expressed in that time of, of, of terms. And I'm pretty sure Christoph has stated exactly this theorem. Now, what, what, we, what I explained last time, uh, so let me re re remind now, because you, you don't need really to be well acquainted to the, uh, you know, to the Leuven equation or to the, uh, in order to understand what follows, right? So what you need to, under, what you need to keep uh, in mind is that when you have an increasing set you know, an increasing family of compact sets like this, that is parameterized by capacity, and that is, roughly speaking, growing locally. You know, it, it doesn't grow here, and then here, and then here, and then here. It just always grows locally near one point in that sense. Um, then it is possible to find then a function w such that this increasing family of compact sets is defined via this uh, procedure here. This is not a difficult theorem. I mean, you just need to say that, roughly speaking, the local growth condition just enables you to define WT to be the, 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 the image under GT of uh, the piece where it is actually growing. And this is well defined because it grows locally. So it says that this red, when this red thing goes to zero, this goes down to a point. You define WT, and then you have to check that uh, with this choice of WT, you solve the ordinary differential equation. So SLE, remember, stochastic Leuvenet equation in the upper half plane is defined as the, the, the Hull KT that is defined when you use property one implies property two, right? So you say, you choose WT to be a Brownian motion running at speed kappa, and then this defines for you this uh, GT, and it defines for you an increasing family of compact sets that satisfies this. Right? And you don't know a priori, you know, for the moment, we don't know whether this procedure actually constructs a curve, or we just know because of this property that it constructs an increasing family of compact sets satisfying this local growth condition. Okay. And of course, if you want to define a Leuvenet chain in another domain, so maybe I should, so maybe I take any domain D here, right, and I'm going from X to, uh, I don't know, to A here. I have an increasing family KT like this. You just say, you just choose a conformal map, you know, capital Phi, that maps D onto the upper half plane. And you're going to declare that this is a Leuvenet chain uh, from X to A in that domain if the image of this thing under this fixed map Phi is a Leuvenet chain in the upper half plane. And that's the way you define a SLE in a given domain D by just saying, take an SLE in the upper half plane and map it conformally onto, onto uh, the domain D. And uh, probably you've seen or in, in the, that the fact that the Brownian scaling property is exactly what tells you that uh, the, structure, the, the growing family of compact sets that you define here uh, does not depend on the actual choice of a, of a conformal map phi that you chose, or phi or phi minus one that you chose to map h zero infinity onto d x a, 
because it's, you know, this, this picture here is scale invariant uh, because of the Brownian scaling property, and that makes it uh, defines uh, uniquely up to time parameterization this growing thing in domain D. Okay, so that's uh, the first thing to have in mind. Now, the second thing to have in mind is Smirnoff's proof of Cardi's formula. So, the idea is you take D and you take two, four points. Okay, I'm going to call them maybe uh, A, B, X, and C, so which is not the usual uh, choice. And for what is going to follow here, it turns out to be simpler to assume that D is bounded and that the boundary of D is a continuous curve. Just makes life slightly easier. Of course, you know there are domains where the boundary is not a continuous curve, but we don't need to worry about that at the moment. Mm. So what you've seen is that if you take a small delta, delta small, define d delta, a delta, b delta, x delta, c delta, uh, an approximation of d, a, b, x, c on the lattice, triangular lattice, of course, with mesh size delta, then the probability to have a crossing, that's what we need, of course. Uh, so A delta, B delta, X delta, C delta. The probability that in this lattice approximation you have a crossing from here to here. This converges as delta goes to zero, okay, to some function, let's call it. Uh, to, let's call it X, where X is defined by, so you have your domain here, A, B, X, C. You have a conformal map, so this is domain D. You have a conformal map, say, Psi, from here onto the, a, B, X, C, where this is an equilateral triangle of width uh, 1. And so, okay, maybe X is not well chosen. This is Psi of uh, little x. And X is just, uh, so I chose B, X, so X is this distance. That's Smirnoff's theorem formulated uh, like this. So the reason I recall this is because uh, I just want to make one comment, which is something which is not very precise in this statement. So what do we call a lattice approximation d delta, a delta, b delta, c delta, little x delta? of D, A, B, C, D, A, A, B, C, X. So in what sense, if we want this convergence to hold, in what sense should the domain D delta approximate the domain D? So the, um, if you remember the proof of, the proof of this, it goes as follows. First of all, you, you take the x in the middle, 
somewhere, and you want to prove that uh, some function is analytic inside the domain, right? So you, you know you have these color switching things, this, then you define h1, h tau, h tau squared, and then you define some analytic function, and the way you prove it's analytic is by doing some contour integrals in the middle. Uh, and what you do is first you have tightness, and then you have a subsequential limit, and then you prove that the subsequential limit is analytic and has the right boundary conditions, and which makes, which pins it down. So the fact that it has subsequential limits uh, and, and uh, that it's tight doesn't need any fine you know, properties of convergence of the boundary of D delta to the boundary of D. So that's one remark. The second remark is uh, the analyticity in the inside of the domain for a subsequential limit in the proof of Smirnoff's result just uses some information of what happens inside. So you don't need, again, to any fine, uh, I mean, fine uh, convergence property. And uh, then to check the boundary condition again, it's just uh, based on Rousseau-Selmer Welsh time argument, so you don't need much. So it is enough. So what I'm going to say, it is enough uh, to assume that d delta, a delta, b delta, c delta, x delta converges to d, a, b, c, x in the sense that for any z, so basically that the inside of d, you know, the interior of d should eventually be in all the d deltas. Right? So that uh, basically uh, for any z uh, being in the interior, basically uh, Z is in the delta for all small delta. And actually, the statement should be more uniform. Say, for each compact subset of D, the compact subset of D will be in all of the D deltas when D is small. Okay? That means that basically, if I have, I have my domain D here, what I say is that if I take a sub subdomain here, A, then basically the boundary of the delta has to be outside of k of a for any small delta. Okay, that's the first assumption. And then you have to check, the, so that's the, 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 first, the first thing, and so the right statement is rather in terms of compact subsets of, of d, and the second statement is the fact, well, the boundary has to be close to the boundary of d, right? The boundary of d delta has to be close to the boundary of d, but here the, the only thing we assume is that for any z on the boundary of d, the distance of z with the boundary of d delta goes to zero. As delta goes to zero. So roughly speaking, okay, I'm slightly sloppy here, but what I'm saying is that you allow, this is what I, the, the, what I want to say. So imagine that this is d. And that you take d delta, for instance, to be an approximation like this. You take an approximation like this, and when delta goes to zero, this field closes up. Okay. Then you can still define you know, the subsequential limits here. Check that it's analytic here. This is no problem. And then. The boundary conditions, you know, remember, so if this is between B and C, remember the thing was saying that one function is equal to zero here, right? But this is still true even, though, even if you are here because of rousseau selmer wells you know, you know that you will find circuits here and that the circuit will go out, will hit the boundary if you are uh, near to the boundary, even, though, even if the boundary is not uh, very smooth. You know, if you have an annulus and the boundary of the delta is a simple, is a curve, then you, you will be able to to, to check that this function has the right boundary conditions. So what I want to say is that, emphasize here, because we need it, is that in the proof of Smirnoff's theorem, the convergence of d delta to d can be assumed to be just a convergence in that sense, so that basically the boundary, that's the idea, that the boundary of seen from the inside, right, the boundary of d delta converges to the boundary of d, 
uh, okay, uh, that's what we, is called Karateodori convergence, but I don't want to say these words in, the, in this sense, so that basically when I take a, a Brownian motion or say started from Z in the inside, basically the support of the set of points that you hit when you get out of D delta will tend to things that are supported on the boundary of D itself. So, you know, this, if this force closes up, you, you don't care. Okay. So roughly speaking, the, the idea is basically if you have, if you're looking at a crossing probability from here to here, say, uh, to here in that domain, when this guy closes up, the crossing probability from here to this part of the boundary converges to the crossing probability from here to here. Right? Because it's very unlikely the probability goes to zero that you have to go through this field to hit to the other boundary without actually hitting uh, the the boundary here when it closes up. So I'm sorry, I have to, I want to you know, recall these two things because these are the two basic ingredients that you know, that you need uh, in order to prove what we want to prove today or start to prove today. Because probably today will be the most uh, technical, uh, well, it's not very technical, but uh, lecture of the series. So what we want now is to prove that, so we still have this setup where D, A, B, C, X, and we want to prove more than just the convergence of these probabilities of existence of crossings. So remember, if you have Smirnoff's theorem that tells you for one given uh, quadrilateral, it tells you uh, what the probability is that there is a crossing, but it doesn't tell you as soon as, say, you want a, another information, say, what is the probability that there is a crossing from here to here and the crossing, say, from here to here. This limit when delta goes to zero is not described by Smirnoff's theorem. This is not, not something that you can, uh, right? You know the probability of this guy, you know the probability of this guy, but you don't know the probability of the intersection in the limit when delta goes to zero. So you need to, to in order to try to understand basically all these limiting uh, configurations or probabilities of configurations inside the percolation picture, uh, you need more than just the crossing probability. And the trick is now to try to say, to understand not the, just this one event, but so you define D delta. Okay, let me draw it, draw it like this now, X, A, B, and C like this, A delta. Okay. And we're going to draw the interface between, so imagine that the cells are colored in green and in red. So imagine that here you color this boundary in red, this boundary in green. And you want to understand the interface between the set of red cells attached to the red part of the boundary and the set of green cells attached to that part of the boundary. Okay? This is this exploration process I've defined for you and that you have seen already uh, several times. And this is a random discrete curve, gamma delta. So you, it's discrete, but you can, of course, view it as a continuous function, you know, by doing some linear interpolation on the, on, on, on the grid. So if you look at the lecture notes, you know, we have plenty of pictures of the exploration process and what it means, you know, in terms of the picture by, and I explained to you last time that this exploration guy could be defined, you know, locally by just discovering uh, progressively this, the colors of the cells, uh, that the tip of this exploration process progressively discovers. Okay, so the question is, you know, so the, want, what we want, we want to prove that gamma delta, that the law of gamma delta converges as delta goes to zero to the law of an SLE6, so uh, 
from x to a and d. So in fact, you have to be slightly careful about what we mean by what, what the statement means. So the first remark is the way I've defined SLE for you before uh, was that SLE is a growing set of compact hulls that grow locally. I haven't told you that SLE was a curve. So when we say that this converges to the law of an SLE is actually, actually this means that gamma delta converges in law to some gamma, which is a random curve. And KT so, uh, is defined to be basically the envelope of gamma up to time t. So what I mean by that is an SLE 6. So what, what I mean by that is that you have this growing curve gamma. Satisfy something like that. Once you have the growing curve gamma, you know sometimes it bumps onto its own path, and it exactly does this what you type of things I've shown you before that you know you you make a big big loop around uh, uh, some compact set, and then it, you swallow the entire interior uh, simultaneously. So what you do, what this means is that gamma delta converges to gamma, and that when you define when you have gamma, then you define kt to be basically not only the curve gamma, but also gamma in plus all the loops that, you know, all the interior that your gamma has disconnected. And then that this kt that is defined by this guy is an SLE6. So contained in this statement is a highly non-trivial fact, which is that if you define, you know, SLE6, so you start with a Brown WT to be a Brown emotion running at speed uh, 6, this defines for you an increasing set of compact sets KT. The non-trivial thing that is contained in the statement is that this special family of growing sets KT is actually, of course, generated by a continuous curve gamma. So for instance, that these sort of pathologies, you know, like winding around a circle, winding uh, out again, or that Christophe has shown you, do not uh, happen in this when WT is a Brownian motion running at speed 6 times T. So, is that clear? So, and the second thing, of course, which is you have to be precise about what you mean that gamma delta converges to gamma. You know, what topo in what, to what is the topology that you use in order to say that you have convergence? So the topology is the natural topology that you want to use here. Convergence of continuous curves is with respect to the distance d gamma gamma prime, right? we're going to say that two curves, you know, gamma and gamma primes are close to each other if, um, so one problem we have here is the fact that uh, the time parameterization, you know, we want to be slightly it's not something that's intrinsically defined by gamma. So we want to, to say that this is the infimum over phi, where phi sort of is from 0, 1 into 0, 1, in, and increasing bijection from 0, 1 onto 0, 1 of the maximum of uh, gamma of s minus gamma of phi of s. So what I mean by that is if I have two continuous curves, gamma and gamma prime, we say that they are very close to each other if you can find the time parameterization of the first one and the time parameterization of the second one such that they remain uh, uniformly close to each other. Right? So it's a uniform convergence, basically, of continuous curves modulo time reparameterization. Re That's the idea. I'm sorry? Five 
phi has to be a continuous increasing bijection, uh, just a reparameterization of, of, of the curve. The fact that I take 0, 1 or 0, 1 here is not relevant. It's just you can parameterize by from 0 infinity to 0 infinity or whatever, but it has to be a continuous curve from A to B. So that's, it's better to have a compact uh, time interval to here in that picture. Okay, so now I hope that I have put all the different, uh, uh, I re that I've recalled uh, what is needed and that uh, I have stated clearly the, what we want to prove, but so far we haven't proved anything, right? So I just reminded you the different uh, tools that we want to use. So now, so step one, of this proof is to use tightness. So in a way, this is similar to what you've done in Smirnov's proof, which is that you want to say that uh, because of rousseau seymour welsh roughly speaking, uh, the probability that gamma, you know, goes back and forth many times, that it wiggles, you know, that gamma delta wiggles, uh, becomes very wild, you know, uh, is controlled as delta goes to zero. So, for instance, just to give you an, an example, if I take two disks of side R1 and R2 here, two circles of size R1 and R2, which are contained in D somewhere, What Rousseau Seymour Welsh tells you is that the probability, say, here that you have uh, uh, four arms like this, or maybe maybe let's let me just it's probably simpler just to take one one color. The probability to have one green curve, did I use green here? Yes. One green curve consisting of green cells in D delta joining this circle to that circle, this probability is bounded from below by some constant, right? uh, bounded from above by some constant which is strictly smaller than one uniformly with respect to delta, right? Because you have a positive probability that does not depend on delta of having an orange circuit here. And so, therefore, the probability to have two disjoint guys here will be bounded from above uh, because of the BK inequality, will be bounded from above by this constant squared because you want two disjoint uh, uh, curves. And the probability to have, say, K disjoint uh, crossings of this annulus will be bounded by some universal constant to the power k, if k is the number of arms, uh, uh, uniformly with respect to delta, as delta goes to zero. Right? Now, what we want to prevent right, is, is the fact that, I mean, what can happen to the curve gamma delta? We want to use tightness to say that the sequence of continuous curves gamma delta, you know, when delta goes to zero, that it, this has subsequential limits, which are continuous curves, which is a measure supported in continuous curves. So what we want to prevent is that the curves gamma delta, this might be gamma delta, and that a bit later, you know, it, it, it makes more and more, uh, it wiggles more and more on macroscopic scale, and that therefore there's no limiting curve. You know, that you don't stay in a space of, uh, that you control well. Uh, so here, what you know is that if the curve gamma would go back and forth k times here, if gamma delta would go back and forth k times between the circle of radius R1 and the circle of radius R2, then necessarily it means that you have disjoint uh, green yeah. if you go back and forth k times, then you have, to, you have at least k disjoint green crossings. And so the probability that gamma delta you know, goes back and forth uh, more than k times from in this uh, annulus is controlled. 
uniformly with respect to delta. Once you have R1, R2, you control this uniformly with respect to delta. Okay? So, so maybe I, this is maybe a part I will leave to, to Christophe, uh, no, to Pierre in, in one of the afternoon sessions. Uh, basically, what this is telling you, right, is, is just basically this argument. So, is that the Rousseau Seymour Welsh, which is uniform with respect to delta, enables to show that the families P delta, which is the law of gamma delta, that the family is tight. Remember what it means for a family of probability measures to be tight. It just means that for any epsilon, you can find a compact set in your uh, set of, in which this is defined, such that the, for any delta, P delta has a mass one of, uh, one of I mean, the, the mass of this compact set is at least one uh, minus epsilon for any delta. That means that basically you can find a compact set such that you have uniformly controlled the fact that all the mass of P delta is, almost all the mass of P delta is there in this compact set. Right? And because you know the, that the family, you know that the sequence of probability measures on a compact space uh, is uh, compact. That means, you know, if you have uh, distributions on a compact space, this will always have subsequential limits. The fact that you control that you have tightness, I'm just doing hand-waving proof of Prohorov's theorem. When you have tightness, then basically you will have, for any epsilon, you have subsequential limits of a portion of P delta that has a mass 1 minus delta, 1 minus epsilon. So here, the set of functions, I mean, the set, the set of, comp I mean, the compact subset on the, of the set of functions that you're going to use to prove tightness is basically a set, is a set of continuous functions, gamma, that do not wiggle too much. That's what you mean, right? You are not allowed, you know, to make too many back and forth crossings of given annuli. And it's not difficult to see that if you have a curve gamma that is not allowed to make too many back and forth wiggling of uh, certain annuli, that, and if this is true at, at every scale, roughly speaking, then, then you, will, you will have a, um, uh, this is a compact set. Because if you take, imagine you take a, se a sequence of, 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 of curves, right? And these curves are continuous, and they're not allowed to wiggle back and forth too much, then you know by just diagonal type trick or something, you, you will be able to prove that there's a subsequent limit for the sequence of curves. So this will be detailed in, in, in Pierre's, uh, in, Pierre's uh, uh, in one of the afternoon sessions by Pierre, which is basically that where you make this very precise. Actually, if you want to start thinking about this before uh, his session, in these, uh, I guess you also have the Park City notes, right? They have been distributed. So there's, that's the second exercise sheet of the Park City notes, which is precisely proving this lemma, which is that uh, for any delta n goes to zero, there exists nk that goes to infinity such that p delta nk converges. Just, right, so if you have a family that is tight, then it's what we relatively compact. So that means that uh, you can find subsequent limits for this for these laws. Okay, so this is a slightly abstract thing, but it just says when I let the mesh of the lattice go to zero, the curve gamma is uniformly controlled. I mean, cannot you know wiggle back and forth too much, and therefore the fact that there exists subsequent limits for the law of gamma deltas. This you get basically for free. Of course, then the big question is to say, well, prove that there exists only one possible limit and show that it is SLE6. So this is a little bit analogous to the proof of Smirnov's theorem itself. Right? Remember, you, you, we started, you had Rousseau-Semmel-Welsh. 
Bruce is here more tells you, roughly speaking, that the crossing probability, you know, in this quadrilateral, is bounded from above and from below by some constant that is independent of delta and that is strictly positive and strictly smaller than one. Right. So, okay, you have a sequence when delta goes to zero, you have a sequence of numbers that is between epsilon and one minus epsilon. So the fact that you can find subsequential limits that converge, you have for free. And the, the, the big question is to prove that actually there's only one limit okay. and to identify it. And so here is the same except that you have to view Rousseau and Welsh not only in terms of crossing of one, of one single event, but globally, simultaneously, all over the place, you want to prove that you don't have many uh, crossings of annuli uh, by uh, disjoint uh, curves. Is this clear? So the reason I'm leaving this for the exercise session is, first of all, because um, I think you don't need to go through the details in order to at least, you know, you, this is something you can say, okay, I believe you. Uh, one has some intuition. And the second thing is that it's not, this is some, something that is slightly, uh, it's not needed to go through the details here to understand the ideas that come later. So this is somehow the tightness issue is, of course, directly related, but uh, not needed later on. Once you know that you have subsequential limits, then you're, you're okay. So the second, uh, so now we assume that delta n goes to zero is chosen in such a way that P delta n converges as n go to infinity. And if it converges because to P, the law of a continuous random curve, yeah, right? We have, we, you have a relatively compact uh, sequence, so it can have many, you know, it could have many subsequential limits, you want to prove that there's just one. So we assume that we take a sequence that converges, and we want to prove that this converges, this limit, is S6, right? We want to prove that the law of gamma is necessarily S6, OK? So now it is convenient to use Cohort's representation theorem because if you have a sequence of probability measures that converges, okay, it is possible. It is always possible to to define on the same probability space a realization of each of the probability measures in such a way that so uh, uh, that the instances basically of, of each of these probability measures converges almost surely converge almost surely so what i say here is that by cohort uh, how is this cohort representation theorem it is possible to define all gamma delta n's and gamma on the same probability space in such a way that gamma delta n converges almost surely to gamma. Okay. You know, if you have a family of probability measures that converges, you it is possible, to, you know, by abstract, uh, simple arguments, to say that it's possible to define uh, or to represent it concretely as an almost sure convergence of realizations of if you want to define on the same space. So I don't want to go into the proof of this classical thing. It's what you would expect, right? So the fact that you can 
I mean, in practice, it's not so clear, you know, how to couple, you know, percolation uh, on that lattice and on that other lattice so that the gamma delta ends remain close. But this just, you know, the, the, you have a convergence already, and then because of compactness, and then you just say, well, for abstract nonsense, you say it's possible to have a realization of all these curves gamma delta n on the same probability space in such a way that they remain close. And here, the, the convergence here is with respect to the distance over there, right? So that indeed the gamma delta n's become closer and closer in that sense over there to the gamma. Okay? So, Let me see, I have to decide where to make a break. Um, yeah, maybe now is a good time to make a break. So let, let us just sort of keep in mind what we have done so far. So what I did, I recalled Smirnov's result, the definition of what is a Lovner chain. Right? And we started to try to prove, we want to prove that these, uh, laws of, of this interface converge to SLV6. What we have reached here, well, we didn't prove it, but you, you will, for those who are interested, they will see it in the exercise session. What you have reached here, the fact that there are subsequential limits for the law of gamma delta n. Now, you just take one of co sequence that converges and you want to prove that the limit has to be SLV6. If you do this, then you are fine, then gamma delta itself will converge in law to uh, the law of SLV6. Now, what you do is you take a, a realization of all the gamma delta n's on the same space in such a way that the gamma delta n's actually converge almost surely to gamma. And now we want to say, OK, uh, so we will start doing after the break is that we want to prove that this gamma is an SLE6. So of course, the, the tool that we have to use and that we haven't used at all yet right, is Smirnoff, I mean, Cardi Smirnoff formula. Right? We, we need to use at some point uh, the conformal invariance that was coming out of uh, the Cardi Smirnoff formula to show that this is an SLE6, which also contains conformal invariance in it, uh, as in its definition. So uh, this is what we will have to do basically. How, how does, do you prove uh, these things? So the proof will be divided in two steps. Uh, and, and We'll see that after the break. The first step will be, we have a continuous curve gamma. It defines a hull kt by, you know, by taking the envelope of gamma, you construct a hull. The first thing is to prove that this hull kt satisfies the condition that tell you that it is a Lovner chain. Right? You have a random continuous curve gamma that defines a random set kt. And what you need to prove is, prove that almost surely KT satisfy the, this nested sequence of, of compact, increasing sequence of compact sets. What you want to prove is that it satisfies the condition, uh, I mean, prop, property uh, two, right? So that the capacity is strictly increasing in the sense that you can parameterize it in such a way that the capacity increases linearly. That's the step, no, that's the first thing to check. And the second thing is that it increases locally, the local growth condition. Once you have this, you will be able to say, well, then gamma t defines a continuous function w t. So it, is a Lov it defines a Lovner chain, and we want to prove that, uh, and, and therefore we have a random continuous function w. And then the second step will be, okay, we want to prove that w t is Brown in motion running at speed six. How do you prove such a thing? The idea will be to say, well, uh, because of, of Smirnov's formula, uh, we will be able to say that the conditional probability given gamma up to time t of existence of a crossing, uh, that this will be a martingale. So what we'll end up with using Smirnov's theorem, we'll define a continuous martingale, which is this continuous evolution of the probability of crossings. And then you are in good shape, so maybe, I don't know how much stochastic calculus you have uh, uh, swallowed yet, but if you have a one-dimensional continuous martingale, then there's a representation theorem by, uh, I don't know, Dubin-Schwarz, I think, 
that tell you that the one-dimensional continuous martingale is necessarily a time-changed Brownian motion. Right? So once you have a continuous martingale, once you have something that is a martingale that evolves continuously with time, so that means that behind the scene there is a Brownian motion. And that's the Brownian motion that we will want to catch, you know, to say that that's the guy that is behind W. So, so this is the way you, uh, we, we get a Brownian motion by, by, by finding continuous martingale. So we come do that after the break. So maybe we do a 15-minute break till, till 11.